And the philosophy behind that is not that you need to be a hand weaver, but that practicing craft as a designer trains sensitivity. So there's something about nuances, about small details in whatever you do that seems to have a direct translation to sensitivity. And the more sensitivity we can create, it seems like our engagement with the world becomes that much more dynamic mm. and interesting. And it's not sensitivity from a vulnerable point of view. It's not sensitivity from that. It's like just... So with movement, we can do this. We mm. ultimately are trying to train our sensitivity. We're trying to be aware of small things. So movement and finding fluidity, as you would term it, uh, is definitely something that on reflection uh, I've realized has become such an integral part of my life, especially over the last, I mean, it's been an integral part of my life for the, like the last 10, 15 years, but the last few months have been an interesting evolution of my journey with, with movement. Uh, so... Thinking about that this morning, a lot of it started with Carlos, and I know you've listened to that episode I did with him, and that was also a fascinating conversation um, around movement, and that opened my eyes to a lot, a lot more to this this field. So I did a workshop with him. It was only a one-off thing, but it was I got a taste for this kind of direct experience through through movement, um, which I'd never had before, and I was quite interested. And then, you know, <laughs> luck would have it, we got into the Friday flows. And that has been this has been such a nice weekly practice for me, obviously doing it with you and having these experiences. And so I want to delve into that today and kind of kind of break it apart a bit, delve into a bit of the philosophy. I'm really interested in the 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 sacred spiritual aspect of it and also just the overall kind of body awareness that comes from this practice. So there's a lot I want to chat today. Um, thank you so much for being here. And um, I I was thinking of kickstarting this off a bit with you know a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today because I think what I love about your style Ben is you know I don't come to you to do a yoga class or come to do a this or that you know I come to move and you kind of encourage that that your own expression through movement and it's, it's very unique so you've obviously taken you obviously learned a lot through the years I'm assuming and you've kind of made it your own practice which is really great to see so how did you get there and like what was that process like cool um, yeah, firstly, thanks for having me on the, on the show. Very exciting. <laughs> and I wanted to touch on saying just to begin with, which was, cause I've been listening to a few of your podcasts and I really enjoy them. And there was something you spoke about of why do a podcast? Why start a podcast when there's so many amazing podcasts out there and First of all, yes, everybody is unique in themselves. So each story is unique and useful and beneficial to the world. But I actually thought about it from another point of view. And the fact that all the people that you have on your podcast are based within the Cape Town area. And what that means is that for anyone in the world, yes, they can gain insight and knowledge. But from a local, it means that I can listen to this podcast, be inspired, but also call that person meet that person, collaborate with that person. So not only is it documenting stories, ideas, but it's also creating a network that is actually feasible, like mm. you know, on a physical level. Like I can physically go to that place, take that product, speak to this person, maybe workshop together. Uh, and I think that, that excites me. Yeah, so I listened, I listened to Carlos's podcast and I, uh, I really enjoyed his philosophy. It reminds me a lot of a f close friend and teacher called Dave Gardner, which is also a very Zen-inspired kind of cut to the chase. Yeah. Um, so I wanted with this podcast not to just tap into the same things and where that podcast felt like it was a much more about what is the essence of movement, I wanted this to be more about what are the tools like what are like genuine principles I can use um, and explore to make the practice less philosophical and also more tangible. Mm. So 
to start off, quick background on my, my journey. Typical South African youngster growing up, playing every sport that you could think of, I get my hands on, but ultimately in high school, really focusing on the swimming aspect. Swimming a lot, playing a lot of water polo, and the water was everything I did. I'm very grateful for that because I think from a strengthening point of view, it really set me up in a, in a good way. It, the water polo created a lot of, lot of strength in the legs, um, a lot of strength in the back, arms, um, and you know, coordination all around. So I was very, I'm very grateful for that foundation. And I think it's an amazing foundation practice for any youngster. You know, just get them in the, get them in the water, get them swimming. Um, then my first experience with, with yoga was actually on a gap year in New York. And it was much more of a, quite a unique experience. It was like kind of like more of like a tantric, tantric workshop. Uh, whereas when you're 19 in New York City on a gap year, uh, it's, uh, you're like, oh yes, so this is what life is about. It's like, there's more than just the high school bullshit. Uh, and that really tweaked my interest. I was like, ah, oh, there's something here. Came back to Cape Town and I was struggling a lot with skin allergies and uh, what to do with my life and everything. I was about 19. My mother suggested that there's this amazing yoga teacher I go and see. So I went to go and have a session with her. First lesson, walked in and just felt an immediate draw towards this lady and also to the practice and to her space. So pretty much for about two years, my only experience of yoga was one-on-one -on -one with a highly experienced teacher that's been teaching for decades, um, that was in her, now is in her 70s, but was in her 60s back then. And just so grateful for that foundational practice with her because it was so much about the spirit of the practice and it was so much about the subtleties, like really, can you feel the subtlety of each movement? Uh, we also did like very long yoga nidras, which is kind of guided sleep meditation. Um, so yeah, my intro to yoga was on a very deep healing way. And mm -hmm. like, let's cut to the chase. Let's really get to the heart of this. So that will always be my foundation, I think. From there, I dabbled in every type of yoga from Bikram to Kundalini, power yoga, Ashtanga, uh, everything under the sun I've, 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 I've played with. But I would say that my real transition into movement came when I was 21 and when I moved to Israel and spent most of my 20s there till about 28 and arrived in Tel Aviv, wasn't sure what to do with myself. My girlfriend at the time was saying like, go get into martial arts because I did some karate as a, as a child. Looked online, typed in martial arts Tel Aviv, and I went to a Taekwondo class and a Jiu-Jitsu class, and then I saw Capoeira Tel Aviv. Called the guy, went to the studio, and it was the same experience with my yoga teacher. Like, as I walked into the space, as the class started, it was just like this deep knowing. Okay. Just absolute love. And then for about six years, Capoeira was my life. Israel is the biggest Capoeira community outside of Brazil. Uh, so I would say my movement highly inspired by that practice, and I think it's an incredible. And what is capoeira? If I'm not honestly, like capoeira is a is a, is an so it's a cool story. This so yeah. let's go into it a little bit. Um, so your historians have dated it back to what they believe was your kind of like southwestern Africa, so Angola, those kind of areas, and when those slaves were taken over to Brazil. They believe that the origin, origin of capoeira could be traced back to this one tribal area and they had something called the zebra dance. And the dance was very energetic. It was very, it was more of like, a, almost like a mating ritual in the tribe. All the men would go into the circle and do this dance. And it was a lot about high jumping and kicking, back kicking. Almost, if you can imagine a zebra mm -hmm. kicking, kind of that. And uh, I've seen footage of this dance and it's uh, kind of extinct now, but it was super dynamic. I mean, they could really kick, I mean, if they had to land that. 
So then the theory goes, and again, this is all just this is all just theory. There's no hardcore proof, but they they feel that then those slaves being taken to Brazil by the Portuguese, then being confined into small quarters, kind of the game developed from the zebra dance into more of a low game, a low dance because of because of spatial issues, and then. Also, the fact that they needed to protect themselves and be more physically active, they started to turn it into more of a defensive style uh, because they would, you know, these, they, they, all these kind of capoeira stories about these legends that as slaves living on the docks and stuff like that, it was dangerous, you know, it was a dangerous environment to live in. And not only that, the, they weren't allowed to practice martial arts, so slave owners and so on wouldn't allow them to actually practice these defensive practices. So they have these songs, which is kind of translates to change the game because the owner is coming, be careful. And then the, the martial art practice would move to more of a dance practice so that the slave owners thought that they were actually dancing. So then... And then also mixed in with, you know, over the years, the Latin American culture and that, that vibe. So capoeira has turned into this martial art practice, which is deeply rooted in African ritual and music, uh, has evolved into a very dynamic movement pattern that is defensive, but at the same time, very expressive from a dance point of view. And there's a very well-known one of the core f fundamental principles of capoeira is this thing called manjinga. And manjinga basically means that, like, don't take life too seriously. But at the same time, don't be naive to think that evil doesn't exist in the world. So the way you practice this is like, when you're playing with someone, like, be easy. Like, just have fun. But don't think you're not going to kick it in the head. You know, so block your face. So it's all about this game of how do I be loose, easy, relaxed, but at the same time, not vulnerable. Mm. And if I do want to make myself vulnerable, why? Sure. What am I trying to like invite that person in to do? And I've always seen, and so capoeira is traditionally practiced in a circle. They call it a hoda. And in the circle, you have the bataria, which is the, um, the instruments, mm. which is like you have like the atabaki, which is more of a drum. It's like a boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom kind of sound. You have the panderos, which is that, uh, that hand drum, handheld drum with the shakers around it. Mm -hmm. You have shakers, you have like a triangle type thing. And then you have the foundational instruments, which is called the birimbao, which is an African, based off an African instrument. Um, uh, I think the traditional African instrument is called nohadi. It looks like a bow, a small bow with a string and a kind of like a, a pumpkin shell or calabash, mm. and that they put on their chest. And it's like a tick, tick, a ding, dong, dong. The capoeira version is made from an, uh, an indigenous tree in Brazil, and it's much bigger. It's a much bigger bow. It's probably about a meter and a half or so in length. And the calabash you put on your stomach. And you have a stick and you have a stone and you have a shaker. And it creates a sound like a chick ding dong dong chick ding dong uh, And you might have two of those, three of those. Then you have all these instruments kind of playing together with a lead singer. And he's like the master of the circle. He dictates the rhythm, the pace what songs are sung, what lesson he wants people to learn. Um, and then the rest of the circle is the players and they become the chorus. So all the songs have a, an answer and core mm. kind of sound. And each song is, is, is a lesson in itself and is trying to teach a different lesson. Uh, and then you have two people in the middle of the circle that now play a game. And they take all the lessons they've learned from capoeira and now they turn it into an, an actual conversation. Through movement. Through yeah. movement. And wow. then the whole point of capoeira is that the place where you learn your lessons in life is in the middle of the circle. Okay. How to breathe properly, how to stay calm but alert, um, how to move with the rhythm of the song, how to play with someone. Uh, mm. 
and what's nice is these all of this overflows into our day-to-day life these these like lessons or completely ways of moving this is the beautiful thing about all of this and, and so you obviously taken that with your yoga experience and 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 whatnot and, and brought it all together is that what what you how you approach movement yeah so for example like one of the lessons that flows into life is when i'm playing with someone am i tr- because you're always trying to trick the person in a way. Yes. Kind of like I could trip you here, I could kick you there. But then it's a question of, am I playing to play with you, to create this constant flow? And if you watch the, the real masters, it's all suggestion. They're constantly suggesting that they could trip you. They're constantly suggesting that mm. they could kick you in the head. But they don't do it. They stop like in the last split second. The control is incredible. Because they... They just want to show you that they had you, but they don't want the game to stop. Yes. Wow. Okay. And I feel like that's an interesting lesson in terms of like the ego is, do I want to play with you or do I want to beat you? Mm. It's, there's there's a, a brilliant book called Infi- Finite and Infinite Games by James okay. Cars. And it's, it's touching on that whole, you know, you can either play the game to try and win or you can play the game to continue playing the game. Yes. And that's the infinite player. That's the, that's the black the bigger player in life is you play to continue the play. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's so beautiful. So, uh, so that, that I would say is the primary, okay. primary lesson. Then, so that was my world. It was kind of, kind of capoeira. And luckily in Israel, because it's such a massive community there and it's so ingrained in the culture that they would constantly be bringing out, you know, these top, like top masters in the world, the guys you like watch documentaries about mm-hmm. and are considered like leaders in the world, like top, top, top. They're coming out every other month. So you genuinely, on a monthly basis, experiencing unbelievable quality of players. And I would see these guys in their 60s moving like baby monkeys. Wow. I couldn't believe that a guy 65 could move like that. Wow. Like just the agility, the balance, the control. Um, so I think, you know, there's this big, um, push today. You'll find it all over social media and everything around primal movement. Yeah. It's become like quite a craze. Primal. Yes. <laughs> so primal movement or functional movement or, uh, is this idea of like, let's move in a way that actually the body was designed to move, mm. you know, and primal primates, you know, we are monkeys. Yeah. In, in terms of our anatomy and our, of course, we now stand upright and we have all these different characteristics, but this kind of what they call cross lateral movement, really working with diagonals, working with rounded shapes, uh, working up and down, this, this, mm. this dynamic play of how do I move in space in an efficient way? Mm. So, uh, for me, capoeira is the ultimate form of primal movement. Because it's, you learn all the tools, but then you actually have to now play with someone. Mm. So now I can't just rely on, oh, I learned that sequence, which goes one, two, three, four, five. And I repeated that sequence one, two, three, four, five for years, and I've mastered it. But now cu- someone comes to me and plays with me, and I don't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where it's a very useful practice in terms of like, I want to learn the language, but now I want to speak the language and create mm. something dynamic out of that. No, for sure. I mean, it's like you want to take the practice that you have. You, you don't want to just learn a sequence for the sequence of lead, learning a sequence. You want to be able to take that and take it out into your life and, and play with it and use it functionally. I mean, for me personally, I was I got quite into yoga over the last few years and it really was an eye-opening thing for me. But also at some point, it, was, it like came down to the, but why are you doing this? Mm. Why are you doing this? I know you also touched on that quite often. And since doing more of this movement uh, practices with you is getting really in tune with the more subtle subtle movement and your body and the more primal movement and then now i've seen my my yoga practice flourish in ways i never thought it could but also my day-to-day just general moving is it's it, it really brings about a lot more of a heightened self-awareness with with movement um all of the, all of this this movement stuff uh and the primal movements that we, or the some of the the animal movements that we've done in some of the the, the classes with you, is that from capoeira, or is that inspired from that? That um... maybe to answer that question, 
I'll take a slight tangent. When I moved back to Cape Town, I actually kind of let go of capoeira because my first love was yoga. Mm. Uh, so I really made a conscious decision to dive back into yoga. I really wanted to get back into that practice. And I am a massive advocate of yoga. I think it's an incredible practice and it's so diverse in its, in its history, in its nature. But there's a few fundamental aspects of yoga which are, are important, which can link maybe to capoeira. Uh, uh, the first one is, a, so in yoga philosophy, you have something called the Yoga Sutras, which is kind of like the Bible, I guess, of yoga. But it's basically these kind of in Zen, you have these koans, these little statements. Mm. You, you have a similar yeah, thing in yeah. yoga. And there's lots of them. And... There's one which goes yoga asanam stiram sukham, which means that the, the, the practice of yogic posture should always be done with an equal dose of hard and soft, of steadiness and lightness. Mm. And that middle ground is where you should actually strive towards. And a great way to, so you're at ease but alert at the same time. So all postures that you do in yoga, maybe because they're new to you, so it's difficult, but ideally you want to get to a place where it's effortless. Mm. Uh, now that's a journey onto itself. How do you find the effortlessness in a really challenging position, which yeah. the muscles aren't there or the flexibility's not there or whatever it is, you know? And one way we really help this is by using the breath as a kind of an anchor or a guideline. When the breath is calm, deep, soft more than likely there's going to be less strain and that comes to this kind of sentence which also again in yoga which is called the the great bird of prana rides on the breath prana being life force or chi the subtle body and it says that it rides on the breath so therefore the most direct way to access that subtle body that sense of ease is through the breath or to access the, the pranamaya kosha or the prana body. And in yoga, breath work is called pranayam. Mm. It's not called breath work. It's called life force. I like to always translate it, although people don't agree with me, as pranayama, yama being ethics. I see it as like the ethics of life force. So I feel for me when teaching and creating a space that this should always be a central channel ultimately we want to move and we want to create shapes and have fun but we want to tap into this pranic body the mm -hmm. subtle body because from there movement becomes very profound and it doesn't matter if you are standing stretching doing a complicated movement doing a series of movements that doesn't matter if you accessing the subtle body that movement or posture becomes incredibly powerful but it's the subtle body mm. so it's not easy to access yeah. so this is the balance especially when you're starting because when you're starting you're like trying hard to and you forget to, you know get back to the breath and yes. the subtle body that comes almost with knocking your head initially and trying too hard or it's you know what it is it's just a it's just an experience thing mm. it's it's not something that can be theorized or or understood it's purely you need to experience your own subtle body and based off that experience you will have a greater awareness of it so my first teacher would always we would always do a posture and stop do a posture stop do a sequence stop can you feel the subtleties if I've done a if I've done an asymmetrical like triangle pose or trikonasana to my left stop okay the one side feels maybe a tiny bit longer, you know. So in order to experience a subtle body within your practice, give yourself space. Mm. So if you do three or four vinyasas, stop for three breaths. Feel it. Nothing needs to be there. There's no experience you need to have. You're just training yourself just to listen. So that's why we, throughout the classes or throughout the practice, we always do something and then stop. 
do mm. something and stop because that's where you really get a chance yes. to that's where you tune in you, you have this like these little little pauses which are quite magical i've realized it's yes like you come back to yourself and it's, it's all that in between where the magic is i found exactly if you're basically taking account of what you've done it's like i've done this now i want to experience what i've done in the subtle version mm-hmm. and the more you practice this this kind of like do listen do listen do listen mm-hmm. your awareness of the subtle body will expand so that yeah that is always something i'm trying to get people to connect to yes um and then it doesn't matter what so in terms of the movement with what we are doing to give people background um i'm deeply inspired by a yoga style called yoga synergy which was started by, founded by a guy called Simon Borg Olafia. He's based in Sydney. He must be in his 70s now. Also, just full vibrancy. <clears throat> like, the, what he can, the way he can move with his body. I think he's probably one of the best yoga practitioners in the world and also probably one of the most highly st- studied. You know, he studied with all the main masters of, studied with Iyengar, studied with Patabi Joyce, even though there's a bit of controversy around there. Studied with Desika Cha, who founded Yoga Therapy. Um, so he created Yoga Synergy, which is very much based off the Ashtanga system, but with a much more influence of Qigong. So it's basically taking the Ashtanga system, taking the postures, and working out using roundness. How can I effortlessly flow into these shapes? Because Simon was very, Simon grew up doing a strict Ashtanga and he really went the route and could do like almost everything and then got influenced into the kind of more the Qigong Tai Chi Eastern practices and then once he started feeling that sense of effortless movement he blended the two so that's yoga synergy and I love that practice so we actually always start off our classes with more synergy inspired Mm -hmm. movements which is the the mudra systems and the one-legged balances. So that little sequence has, has influenced my movement great a lot. Yeah. And then we go into more of a Buddhacon yeah. practice. Buddhacon is was founded by a guy called Cameron Shane, based in America. And Cameron is much more of a martial artist. And then basically came up with this yoga inspired movement as a way to train the body to move in certain patterns and there's a lot of spinal mobility yes. and it's all transitional yeah it's not about the posture it's just about moving between shapes yes it's, uh, it's yeah. uh, the the spinal aspect has been something that's definitely um been a big eye-opener for me because mm. you, you kind of take for granted your spinal health. And I remember you telling me a story about, I think it was a professional surfer who... Yes, um, Jerry, Jerry Lopez. I don't know if you want to share that because I found that to be like, wow. And, and now I'm so much more... I find myself in my day just feeling my spinal mobility and even just the subtle nuances in, in the movements now. Mm. It's, you know, spinal health I didn't realize was actually a thing. Yes. So they call it spinal articulation the ability to articulate the spine in a very nuanced way with enormous variety. So, yeah, Jerry Lopez also must be in his 60s or 70s now. Also, just unbelievable vitality for someone that age. And he was the master of pipeline. If anyone's unaware of pipeline, pipeline is like the father or the homeland of big wave surfing in Hawaii. And, you know, we're talking about 30, 40 years ago when he was riding it with these big boards and these waves that could pretty much kill you. And he would just ride it so nonchalant, like lay back, kind of put his hands behind his back and just these massive waves, just absolute, with, with absolute ease. Mm. And he was a big yoga practitioner and still is and has stated very clearly that there's no ways he could still be surfing today if it wasn't for a regular yoga practice. Kelly Slater said the same thing. Probably the main, you know, Kelly Slater is a, is a yoga master, if you actually look what he can do. And he's been surfing on the world tour since he was in his, in, into his 40s. But Jerry Lopez uh, coined a, a statement, which is that the key to longevity is a mobile spine. 
And if you actually look at the anatomy of it, it makes complete sense because for, sp for spine to be mobile, what it means is it means your intrinsic muscles around the spine, which are very small, have to be given the space by the bigger superficial muscles to lead. So it's almost like the superficial side has to let go in order for the subtle side to move. Because you cannot actually move your spine in such a nuanced way from the superficial muscles. The superficial muscles you want there to really keep everything safe. You know, it's like the outer shell. But ideally you want them to know that they can just let go so that all of the subtle muscles that attach, attach to the spine can move it. Then you've got to remember that all of your organs are around the spine. All your breathing apparatus mm. is around the spine. So you have primary breathing muscles, you have accessory muscles, and you have like deep intrinsic breathing muscles. Um, the diaphragm, serratus anterior, a few other, few other muscles. So if you can get these muscles to work, then it means your breathing becomes much more efficient. Interesting. So, uh, and if those muscles are working and the movement is good, it means that the movement around the organs is much better. So your digestion will be better. Your mm. heart will be calmer because the breath is calmer. So your, 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 breath, your, your breath rate and your heart rate are like super intrinsically linked. Mm. In, you know, in yoga, they don't actually say I'm 70 years old, 60 years old, 50 years old. They work it out more. How many breaths have you taken in life? And I remember... Um, listening to Peter speak about this, the fact that the breath actually in some way oxidizes does, does the body and so, so that breathing actually slowly kills you. Okay. So, the, yeah, so the, more, the more we breathe, the more we, we deteriorate the system. Interesting. And that's why they really advocate, you know, for this long, slow, effortless breath. And, uh, and you'll notice this with, pe with, with people uh, that maybe work in high-paced environments or high-stress environments. You speak to them and they speak at like a million miles an hour. Mm. So straight away, you, can, you know that the breath rate is super fast. Yeah. I mean, even just feeling that right now, it's like I know sometimes when I've got a hundred miles things going, I'm scattered, I'm all over the place. I'm just like, but when I'm really like in the zone, focused and like there, it's everything's just slowed down and I'm calmer and I'm just... And it all comes down to the breath. And every now and then, just take a couple of deep breaths and it's just, whew, it just slows everything right down. And it's, it's powerful. Ben, I wanted to, before I forget, I also want to ask you about, I know you explained it once and I thought it was really, really interesting and profound, like your, your triangle and then the inside of the triangle and the outside. Like that whole kind of idea, your, your thoughts around that. Can you share that? That was really interesting for me. Sure. So when I started working with you guys, because um, it was... It wasn't a yoga class and it wasn't this and it was much more around how to train movement but from a like i said from a technical point of view mm. not just from a philosophical point of view i try to work out how do i kind of amalgamate this whole thing into an easy uh, or an understandable concept uh, and when we start in buddhacon we actually create a triangle with our hands on the floor we bow into the triangle yeah i love that uh, so I just like that shape, and also the triangle is a stronger shape in nature. Um, so I thought, okay, cool. If we have this triangle, the points, what are the three points? So I looked at, okay, cool, strength, flexibility, and focus. Like, you need these things to move. And the outside of the triangle is much more around, what I realized is much more around safety. You need strength to keep the joints safe. It's just the way it works. And the more dynamic your strength can be from your finger to your bicep to your inside leg to your outside shoulder, what it, however many muscles you can get to be strong, the better. And if you look at monkeys, they're so strong. I mean, you know, they, they could rip your arm off, uh, mm -hmm. a chimpanzee or something like that. Or an orangutan could l really l rip your arm off. So, so there's something definitely to strength practices um, that is that is important. Then flexibility is crucial because flexibility gives you range, and it gives you dynamism, and it and it also protects the joints. Mm -hmm. And then focus is a similar thing. If if I'm focused on a movement, 
then there's less chance of me doing something that can injure myself. So I figured, you know, those three things you need to, you need to practice, you need to enhance. And there's many different ways one can do that. Mm. And there's a whole, behind each one, there's a whole philosophy. Mm. So that outside the triangle, I see is very much a safety, a safety net. But if we get lost in the safety net, then things become quite robotic and lack of meaning. And we can sometimes see this with maybe the gym or mm. something like that, that it's like, I'm going to lift weights, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that movement. But there doesn't seem to be much substance behind it. There's much, not much connection. It's, it's, it's devoid of meaning. That's got nothing to say that you can't have that meaning in a gym. It's just that's not part of the practice necessarily. So the way I saw that is if those points on the triangle become too focused, it's like a moth to a lamp. Mm. You know, then the practice becomes about strength. And then it has that, that has its own defaults and, and issues because then we can get attached to strength, which can be dangerous. You know? um, so for me, it's very much about what's inside the triangle. What's the space inside the triangle? And that for me is very much us you as a person the, the being the self so what we want to do is we want to strengthen the triangle but move our awareness and our and our practice more to the internal space and to help us get to the internal space that's why i try to think hey what tools do we have to access this space so that the lights of strength flexibility and focus don't draw us back mm-hmm. and for me that's why i looked at those kind of three three filters, let you could call it. Uh, one being just awareness of the breath. Like we spoke about the importance of a slow, calm breath. Mm. Just keeping in touch with your practice. Like, what is my breath doing? What is the sound? What is the texture? What is the speed? Not from a judgment point of view, but just from a curiosity point of view. Mm. Um, the second thing is what I like to call observant curiosity which is whatever is there whatever is coming up whether it's thoughts emotions feelings uh, doesn't really matter can i observe it but be curious with what i'm observing ah interesting my mind is super busy today Mm. like that monkey mind is just running that's cool where's it running to you know um i'm feeling really sad today really heavy today ah interesting where? How do, what, what does that sadness feel like? Where is it? So it's, mm. it's, a, it's observing, but with curiosity. Mm. Then the third filter, which for me is very important, is something called systematic softening. Which is what areas are efficient that if I soften those areas, they have a very direct portal towards the nervous system. For example, the forehead... If you soften the forehead, it has a very intrinsic connection to the nervous system. The hands. The hands have so many neural connections because we use them so much. So if we send focus to the hands, it automatically can calm the nervous system. The belly for breathing, shoulders, jaw. Um, So there are these kind of areas that you can throughout your practice specifically with yoga if you find yourself in a challenging posture just say what is my face doing how much tension is in my face can i soften my forehead can i soften the eyes can i soften the jaw can i smile then you'll probably find that actually you know what i'm i'm going too far Mm. i'm doing the posture but i'm doing the posture in stress and then am I really doing the posture? Yeah. What if I lowered the arm a little bit? What if I lowered the leg a little bit? What if I twisted a little bit less? Ah, now the face feels softer. Okay, so that's more honest. That's mm-hmm. actually where my capabilities are lie. And what you want to do with your practice is understand that boundary. Mm. This is I'm feeling very comfortable and this is challenging it. And you want to always kind of be in that gray, constantly yeah. playing with that boundary. Yeah. And just gradually increasing it, increasing it, increasing it. Um, and then I found that if you use these kind of filters of breath, curiosity, softening, then 
whatever movement practice you do will direct you towards the self, mm. I found. Will direct you towards the subtle body, which is that inner space. Mm. Um, no, that's, that's incredible. I, I had an interesting realization a couple of months ago, and when, I, when it hit me, also I just found my practice becoming like almost yeah a lot more beautiful in a, in a way and i realized so with any kind of movement practice you know a lot of the when you start off you you focus on like getting to that posture and then to the next posture but you forget about the in between subtle space the movement between the postures and once i stopped focusing on getting to the posture and actually enjoying the in between space i just i don't know what happened but i was like in this different state of enjoying and, and my practice just naturally got better or, or mm. for me it got better um so that subtle in between moments and just checking in and then yeah not trying to get there but enjoying that that process that continuous flow of it has just been yeah interesting you touched on the self and and i want to go into a little bit of that i know you you mentioned something once about uh, i think it was the sacred or, or the self, you know, doesn't like to have a light sh shone on it, mm. but you can create the circumstances to kind of attract it near um, that, you know, kind of more esoteric side of your movement. Like, let's go into that. And, and what is your take on that? And how does your movement practice overflow into your, I suppose, your personal, whatever your personal philosophy, uh, philosophy around, you know, this, this reality is the self, the, the sacred. Mm. You know, what are your thoughts on all of that? It's good. Good timing, because we've just because we've looked at the triangle, it's very easy to explain this mm. now. So again, my first yoga teacher, the lady, her name's Kathy Schwager. She's an incredible yoga therapist, if anyone is looking for that kind of practice. She always used to tell me that the soul is shy. So if you shine a bright light, it's gonna hide. So rather bring a candlelight and let that invite the soul in, which actually likes to more dance within the shadows. So, when, so that's why I spoke about the idea of the triangle and the edge of the triangle being light posts. Let's call it focus, flexibility, strength. If these lamp posts, so we want to increase the vibrancy of these lamps because the stronger we are, the safer we are. The stronger, the more flexible we are, again, more safety. Uh, focus we, we need all of these areas to be as lit as possible to give us more freedom in the world but if the self or if the center space gets drawn too much to those lights then that becomes a harsh light that's why i spoke about the filters the three filters so what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase these lamps direct this very harsh light towards the center of the triangle and let it move through these filters of breath, curiosity, softening. Then through those filters, that light starts to soften. And then the engagement with the subtle body, the self, the shy soul becomes more evident. And when that becomes more evident, then there's something about that space that we start to have subtle understandings about ourselves, and that's and that's an individual journey mm. you know whatever um it could be that maybe there's strong emotions happening and because you're able to filter that light you become slightly less attached to that emotion mm. which then gives you a new vantage point into something which might give you healing mm. um so that that is an individual experience and I think as someone, as a teacher or anything the way you, again, my first teacher said, like the, 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 the most important thing a teacher needs to do is hold sacred space. It mm. doesn't matter what you do in that space. It doesn't matter what you teach, what you do, as long as it's, you understand that the space is important. Mm. So all we're trying to do as teachers really is create space so that you can experience yourself and gain your own insights, your own wisdoms, and because we're doing a movement practice, we're using the tools mm. of movement and movement philosophy to engage with that space. Um, 
and then we also look into technical aspects. So from my, my life from capoeira to yoga, while in Israel, I also got really involved in the uh, improvisational and contact improvisational scene. Okay. And this really, really changed my movement in a very dramatic way. Um, so contact improvisation is, is a movement practice that mainly contemporary dancers use. But you get these quite in interesting spaces where you'll go to a dance studio and you'll see a whole bunch of these peop whole bunch of people just randomly moving with each other, normally with some form of physical contact. And there's something about going into that space which challenges every boundary and fear you have. Yeah. It's like now a guy comes up to me, he's seven years old, and now I have to move with him with physical contact. Yeah. So all your insecurities come up. Then a, then a beautiful woman comes up to you and she's, and she's 20 or 25. Then a mother in her 50s comes up to you or now maybe dancing with two or three people. And that practice, the only way to really dive into it is overcoming these fears, overcoming these insecurities and listening. Am I moving with someone? Am I listening to their movement or am I... Are my habitual patterns just, so every time I move my left hand, my right arm wants to go there. And I don't know what quite brought me to this yeah. conversation. I'm kind of lost in, I'm lost in thought now a bit. <laughs> but it's, it's so true that overcoming the fear is, I mean, even starting, starting with the fight I first with you, it was, mm. I mean, that aspect now, I'm so much more comfortable around people to move and express, whereas before you have all these fears of judgment and all these things going on. But the more you kind of step into it and, and get into these practices, you, you can, yeah, you, you push up your boundaries, which then, you know, pushes you as a human. And then, yeah, you're in these spaces where you, you're more comfortable to move. Completely. And I've now just realized where I was going with my okay. thoughts. So thank you for... Thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for bringing me back. Um, where I wanted to go is where I am in my journey now is that I consider myself like an amateur enthusiast improv dancer. Okay. And what that's shown me, and I've done a lot of studying over the years, a lot of practice, a lot of workshops, worked with a lot of amazing teachers all over the world. And what that's shown me is that movement is a language. Mm. And like any language, it has rules. Like if we want to speak English to each other, there's rules, there's, there's grammar, there's words, there's how to construct a sentence, there's tone, all these different aspects. So with movement, it's, it's the same. And this is where technical tools, and this is why I try to bring this a lot into the classes, technical tool, tools give us freedom to know that how, what are the ways I can move the body and what questions can I ask? Okay, right now I want to play with rotation. I want to play with just moving the arm in rotation. In, out, up, down. I want to play with moving the arm, but my eyes always follow my finger. Sorry. Apollo making a noise. Apollo. <laughs> it's good to see. It's good to have a bit of disruption and the dog comes yeah. in, you know, throws yeah. the spanner in the works. There's nothing. It's not a podcast if Apollo doesn't. Uh, <laughs> nice. I've had him knocking over cameras, knocking over lights. At the old, Fantastic. Yeah, part, of Fantastic. The, part of the podcast, Apollo. <laughs> so, so what we learn with improv dancing is that there's two fundamental concepts to in improv dancing. The first is presence. Okay. I want to be present with what's happening. And the second thing is I want to ask myself questions. I want to play a game. Mm. And that game is endless. Um, and this is actually where I wanted to take direct this, this podcast towards or this conversation towards in terms of where I am now mm. and where I see the value of movement. Uh, for example, the one, one classic practice you have is find an object, a stick, a leaf, a stone, Look at the object, observe the object, embody the object. Now, of course, you can't embody a stone, but just the mere fact that you're trying to embody a stone, and how would a stone move? How would that feel in the body? There's something about the taking yourself out of your direct experience into something else that trains a certain sensitivity 
that I found then has impacted my life in a great level. I feel like I'm much more sensitive. Mm. And I actually, surprisingly enough, while I was in Israel, I actually studied textile design. So I actually come from a design background and studying fabric and fabric structure and how to, how to weave oh, and do all these different okay. things. And the school I was at, an amazing university with an amazing department, and you learn a lot of handcrafts. So I've done hours and hours of hand weaving in my life. And the philosophy behind that is not that you need to be a hand weaver, but that practicing craft as a designer trains sensitivity. So there's something about nuances about small details in whatever you do that seems to have a direct translation to sensitivity. And the more sensitivity we can create, it seems like our engagement with the world becomes that much more dynamic mm. and interesting. And it's not sensitivity from a vulnerable point of view. It's not sensitivity from that. It's like just... So with movement, we can do this. We mm. ultimately are trying to train our sensitivity. We're trying to be aware of small things. Yeah. We're trying to be aware of what are my patterns. Yeah. You know, if I, every time I move there, I move up there. Well, why? Mm. Why? Why can't I just move that? Yes. Why can't I just be with the elbow now and just move the elbow around? Yeah. And it, it, the magic is in those subtle, nuanced little movements that you become aware of, which then can shift everything. And it's so mm. small, and I, I think I've told you before, but you know, like most of the, the sessions we do with you, there's always one little thing, and it could be something small, but that small thing translates into you know, something big. Like, for instance, just foot, we did the one, we focus on the foot. And like, mm. I've never put any attention, conscious attention, into my foot or my toes. And it's like flexing, and you know, I don't know what, how you term it, flex and bend but and then how that impacts your all the muscles in your leg and how you move and then it's like oh wow my movements now because i'm conscious of that aspect it's like you become more sensitive to the subtleties yes and like you say it does directly impact your life because then you go through life and you're more sensitive to the smaller things and that's where the magic is it's, it's in those, those those small things that we normally overlook completely the foot is an incredible uh place to focus on I mean, it's, it, is, it is our base. <clears throat> your foundation in life is your feet, are your feet. Excuse my grammar. <laughs> and we spend a lot of time standing. And in yoga, all your standing postures are really about the legs. Yes, there might be twists and there might be that, but it really is about legs. And if you actually look at the foot and look how your entire system is connected to it, for example, there's a, there's a very well-known guy called Thomas Myers. He's much more of a scientist. Uh, and he wrote a book called Anatomy Trains. And it looks at two fundamental concepts, the one being the myofascial web and another one being what, he's, what he calls anatomy lines. So anatomy lines is this idea that the way the muscles in the body work is that they actually work in more unison than we think. For example, there's a certain point in the foot that runs up the inside line of the leg, connects to the inside line of the spine, up through the throat. And now when he wrote this book as a scientist, he actually dissected bodies and actually showed these lines. So it wasn't like a philosophical concept, mm. it was an anatomical scientific mm. approach. And he showed actually how all those muscles connect to each other. So you actually have these practices in the more subtle Movements where you'll lie on your back and you'll be okay, cool, I want to move a part of my foot and now can I feel a reaction move up into the throat? Sure. So the way, so for example, a, f a fundamental concept of human stability is the inner line, is, is the inside arch of the foot. Because of shoes and because of arch supports and because of this false sense of security, that arch collapses. Mm. Which means the entire inside line of the leg which is connected to the entire inside line of the spine, which is connected to the throat, then also weakens. So you'll see this with people, their knees will splay in, and they have much less stability. Okay. Now, they take that practice into yoga and just uh, promote it by now putting the body into positions that it's dangerous, but with complete deactivation. Mm. So now, maybe while younger it's fine, but you will develop issues mm. when you're older. 
Um, so learning the foot, learning how to engage the foot, and learning how to engage the foot in different standing postures, I think is a foundational practice. Mm. And, and I really think for... Um, and just, be, yeah. just being more barefoot, I think, I found has been yeah. like... It's so, I mean, it's obviously gaining more popularity now, but since I've lived out yeah, this year, I've spent a lot more time just barefoot. And I don't know what it is, but there's an increased everything, sensitivity, connection, grounding, all the rest. And, and your feet, you know, it's, if, if we're not careful, we could put them in environments all day long with shoes that are in you know taking away from mm. height and sensitivity and becoming more aware of barefoot's an amazing practice and again this is actually where yoga has a lot of value is that you always practice yoga barefoot yeah um but i would just say to anyone listening just just take a lot of curiosity in your feet mm. the same way you move your hands in different ways do it with your feet mm. move different parts of it try spread the toes push different parts in the ground like Bring dexterity to your feet. Yeah. Bring dynamism, and that will filter up through the body. Yeah. A hundred percent. Sure. Uh, yeah. I wanted to also, you know, tap into as we start to kind of come to an end, what your kind of day to day looks like, and how you, how you embody your practice in a in a more daily way, and what is your specific practices, and how you'd recommend people who are now very curious to explore movement. You know, where would be a starting point? Because, you know, sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming, like, you know, you want to get into all this. And mm. um, where, where would you recommend people start? And, um, yeah, practical advice for starting point. So I think, I think it depends on a few things. I think it depends on what is your background. You know, are you completely new? For sure. Um, or, or do you have some experience? Obviously, if you based in the kind of Nurduk, Scarborough area and you want to come join our classes on Friday, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I, I'm a bit, like I said, I'm a massive advocate of yoga. I think mm. uh, it's, yeah. an, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing practice and it's an amazing longevity practice. Yeah. The earlier you start, I think the better. No, uh, definitely. I think, you know, I'm so glad I started a few years ago because it's not something that's fun when you start because you're completely out of your depth and you, you're like, what am I doing? But if you persevere, it, it has become for me something I can't live without. And then obviously now including this, taking it to a whole new level. So yoga is a great, great completely. longevity practice. And uh, yeah, so the, I only teach what I practice. So I'm very inspired by, like I said, Yoga Synergy and Budokan. Uh very inspired by Qigong, but there's a lot of Qigong in the kind of um, synergy practice. So if you if those styles you would like to experiment with, then my teacher at the moment is a guy called Jim Harrington, who is an incredible yogi, immensely experienced. And his studio in Constantia Reunion, which is a beautiful space in the in the forest, has amazing synergy teachers, amazing Buddhacon teachers, and is the kind of like the, the hub in South Africa for those two styles. So if those two styles are of interest to you, then that's a great mm. studio. Um, and in a, if you're dedicated within a short period of time, you can, I, I rate your movement practice could take on a lot of, mm. a lot of richness. And then what I did want to finish with, because uh, you asked me like my day-to-day -day life and, mm, and, mm. and so on like that. A big part of my life now is that... I work with an NGO called um, Indoni, the Indoni Academy. And it's an African performing arts academy that we take post high school students from the different townships and we put them through a three year program where we focus on dance, music, uh, performance, all, all these different aspects. And what I've seen there is that as South Africans, we have to understand that we are all in a, um, a unified state of trauma. Like there's deep trauma in this country, mm. whether you are impoverished or wealthy, doesn't really make a difference mm. because if you experience suffering or you witness suffering as a collective, we all feel it. So, the natural currency or one of our main currencies in this country is the performing arts. It's in the African spirit. And what we're really trying to do is show how necessary it is to have more of these kind of programs from a healing point of view. So if anyone would like 
to experience that. Obviously, we're almost finishing the year. Next, next week, we have our uh, showcases. But from next year, if anyone would like to get involved, come and attend classes uh, and see that side of the world, I would highly recommend that from a healing yeah. point of view. I'll put all the info and links to all of that stuff in the, in the yeah. description and people can check that out. And yeah, sure. That's amazing. That, that'll, be, that'll be brilliant. So, th- so that takes up a lot of my time. Okay. Um, and then I spend a lot of time at the reunion studio Then I work with you guys and then also based on my background in textiles and fashion, mm. I've been slowly building a, a movement, a smart movement brand, which is trying to find a blend between not your athleisure, which is your kind of Nike sportswear kind of mm. yoga gear and not your formal clothing, but some middle ground. So clothing that you feel smart in, that you could go to a meeting in, but you can also go to a class in, dance in, mm. move in, sleep in, whatever. So that's mm. been a, a lifelong mission and I'm still kind of building it. So if anyone wants to get involved, I always need help. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess my, uh, my entire life at the moment is based around movement in some yeah. way. That's incredible. We and Tara were talking uh, two or three nights ago and we decided one of our like five-year goals is going to be to have a space, um, potentially in the Nuruk area or somewhere in the space where we can you know, like a, like a gym style space, but big enough to have a studio, but big enough to incorporate all of this. And then to have people like yourself facilitating amazing things and, and bringing together more of this kind of mm. stuff, movement. And so I would love to see more of it and, and just, yeah, bringing more people together to explore all these different, you know, there, there's so much to this subject, you know, they overflow all into different, you know, movement practices and martial arts and yogas. Mm. And so that would be a dream of ours to have something like that where we can cultivate more, more awareness about it and bring people together to experience it because it honestly has been life changing for me this last few months and movement has been like, it's the one anchor in my life that I can fall back on amidst all the chaos of the world, you know, to just kind of bring me back to myself stillness but a piece a bit of like okay but a grounding okay let's carry on with life and, and this it's just you know to incorporate it daily is is yeah i don't know what i'd do without it so thank you <laughs> amazing that's so cool brother yeah. um i was actually speaking to to mano today about that we've also had, we've kind of planted a seed for when the time is right to also maybe look into like a more holistic movement studio space mm, mm. And, and I was speaking about it as a, like a, almost like a co-op space yeah. where you don't just bring in movement, but you bring in nutrition and you bring in all yes. these different characters that you've yes. had on these podcasts and yes. um, a much more holistic look at movement, what nutrients will help with that, what mm. balances, you know, what kind of, yeah. there's, so, there, there's so much, there's so many avenues that one can explore. Yeah. And I think the main thing is just, developing a very heightened sense of curiosity and a very undogmatic approach. Mm. I found that in my life, whenever I've become dogmatic about a, a yeah. practice, mm. the body stiffens. So everything has value. Everything is, can take you to amazing places, but just stay curious. Stay curious about your fingernails, stay curious about your toe, your elbow, your shoulder, your breath. Bring it back to the mm. tangible and then it doesn't really matter. Eh? Yeah, yeah. I love that because, yeah, we, we sometimes, like you said earlier, you know, you want to shine bright in the one aspect. Sometimes like it's a moth to a flame, you get too caught up in that. And once that becomes, you get too lost in that story, okay, it's time to step back and, and have mm. curiosity for all of it. Because then, then it's just, there's, there's so much more magic. And, you know, the people around me, the network that we've started to form and even through the podcast and, and meeting you guys, that is it's so exciting because you see what everybody brings to the table and it's like we can create a space and I know it's going to happen somehow mm. between all of us where we can bring all these elements together and, and, and have all the different offerings and have different mm. experiences for different people. So I'm excited. I think there's some big things coming in the future and uh, nice. yeah, there's a big a bit of momentum gaining with, with this, with this yeah, Deep South. <laughs> The deep south. I, yeah, I love. I, I love that. Yeah, it's been amazing. Ben, we're gonna wrap this up. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we could chat for hours. There's uh, yeah, so much more. But um, thank you, man. Thank you so much for your time. I don't know if there's anything else you want to leave off, end off with, or yeah. So to end off with, I actually would like to to sum up this whole podcast. Go right back to the beginning, uh, which is 
the origins of my movement story and my first teacher and current teacher, which is my mother. And my mother has been a big, a huge influence in the dance world in South Africa, specifically in Cape Town, and has always taken dance and movement towards social activism. During the heart of apartheid in the 80s, they were running all these groups between black and white dancers, um, doing these very politically um, critical pieces throughout South Africa. And all of your kind of key dance figures in Cape Town somehow came back to that. And during this, this period, she was pregnant with me and I was, so, so in the belly, I was witnessed to this uh, sense of African dance and spirit. Uh, and she was dancing while, while pregnant with me. So I think definitely from a rhythm point of view, that was my first experience. And we actually work a lot together now. We both work and run a African performing arts academy called um, called Ndorni. We're kind of in a rebranding phase, so we might change the name. But where where she focuses now is this style called moving art, which is when you take personal narrative and through movement, use the movement as a form of therapy to give you a greater understanding of that narrative. So for our students who are all based in the various townships who deal with trauma, serious trauma on a daily basis, this has become a very powerful tool for us to deal with suffering, loss, depression. And, you know, movement therapy is not new in the world, but I think where this technique becomes interesting is that it's always taken into performance. So if I had to work with a group, it would end off actually creating a mini performance ourselves. And then often when someone is put in that space, a lot comes out. So I would like to say a massive thank you to my mother for starting me on the journey and dictating where I'm going now and to really see how movement does have immense therapeutic mm -hmm. qualities to it when, when channeled in the right way. And yeah, so just keep on moving. Mm. It's beautiful. And sometimes I think words are like just limited. So movement is where it's at, especially with all these powerful things with our past and, and all these, you know, with the activism you're talking about now. There's so much power in the, the, the nonverbal movement, I think. So that's what, that's what I'm starting to realize, put it that way. I'm only starting to realize that now. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, especially because there's so much memory in the body yeah. that when you let movement inform what you're dealing with, it gives you an, a perspective that you wouldn't have seen before mm. and then turns that perspective into a direct experience, mm. which then can let things settle or you can overcome things. And we've seen this with our students, like dealing with, if it's insecurity, you just make them stand on stage. Uh, and even if they're scared to move, you just, I, I've given that instruction to a student before. I was like, I don't mind what you do, but for that whole period of time, don't leave the stage. And then all she ended up doing was just standing there and looking at the audience. And that was a kind of a very critical moment in her development in terms of just being present and overcoming that fear. So it can be simple. It can be literally standing. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Um, so I think it's more about finding that presence in the movement. If you can find presence in movement, it doesn't matter what it is, it becomes profound. Ah, beautiful. I think it's a perfect way to end off such a KIF podcast. I can't wait to put this energy out there. And I think, uh, yeah, if anybody's interested, um, just reach out to us and we can get involved. Come and join Friday Flows. Yes, please do. Thank you, brother. <laughs>